to uh, <clears throat> pray, and the prayer is based on uh, a reading from Acts 2, which we're, we won't be thinking about Pentecost in particular today, but I've chosen hymns related to the Holy Spirit and tying in our thoughts in Genesis with what Pentecost means. Psalm 126, 1 says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Acts 2, 17, quoting Joel, says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Let us pray. God of gifts and giftings, God of restorings and miracles, we sometimes dream of a day when you will come to us, to our land in revival power. And when you come, the dream will come true. And your glory will dwell powerfully in our covenanted land. If anything, Heavenly Father, of that dream is of the Holy Spirit, answer our prayers and make it come true. God of paradise, God of heaven, we dream of Eden restored in some measure in our own lives. And we thank you for what you have done and are doing and will do. We dream of a return to purity and peace. We dream of experiencing the full blessing of Pentecost and of our being transformed and purified and made bold by the power of the promised Holy Spirit. We have glimpsed that life of love and spiritual energy, and we have tasted the glory of intimate fellowship with yourself. Thank you. But grant us a closer and more consistent communion with you, our God, Father, Son, Spirit. You know how utterly cleansing the blood of Jesus is. Help us to know also. And we thank you that that blood makes us and keeps us continuously clean. Apply the blood, we pray, to all our consciences and free us from condemnation and the accusations of the devil. Come, Holy Spirit. Just in a moment, it was Anything you need to deal with God about just now, just do that in your heart. If not, just praise Him. Lord, we put every thought, every feeling, every action, every word, every behaviour under the blood. Heavenly Father, what is your dream for our lives? Is it not that we should be a holy bride for your Son, Jesus Christ? You have a simple, homely dream. And your dream has been and is being fulfilled down through the ages. As you Draw a blood-bought people to yourself, and one day we will be presented 
to Jesus Christ, the heavenly bridegroom. Make your dream come true. And to that end, we surrender ourselves to you in love. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Our hymn is, The Spirit Lives to Set Us Free. And that's 664 in the book.
form a man, Adam, from the dust of the ground he formed him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Just think about that for a moment. God forming, as it were, like a, a, a potter forming a clay, uh, a clay, a potter uh, or whatever, and then breathing into this body the breath of life, the spirit, breath and spirit of the same word. And the man became a living being or a living soul. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, and this is worthy of note, isn't it? In this absolutely perfect environment with Adam uh, in close communion with God, yet there was something lacking. <laughs> the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. And of course, name is more than just a label, it's character. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Leaving and cleaving and oneness. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. May God bless his word to all our hearts. Now for our prayers, uh, I'm using some of the prayers that we have prayed for 
uh, a long time in our prayer groups, uh, but beginning with um, the hymn, Spirit of Divine, which is in itself a prayer. So uh, if you listen to the hymn, then we'll say there's one, two, three, four, five, eight, four prayers that we'll just say together very uh, softly. But first of all, we'll hear this hymn, and as you hear it, make it your prayer. Spirit of truth, 
convict us of our sins and drive us to our knees in sincere repentance. Convict us also of our need of Jesus and enable us to come fully into his holy healing life. Enable us to confess not only our sins but the sins of others against us so that we become transparent people who shine with Jesus' light and love. Fearless Father God, one thing we need desperately is the spirit of assurance and boldness, the fire of the Spirit. Grant us to know the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we are undaunted in the face of opposition and bold to combat the devil and all his deceits. Empty us of sin and self and worldliness and fill us to overflowing with Christ. May we love Christ and live Christ and proclaim Christ in our frail, fragile, often failing humanity. And this is our text that we're looking at today. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now the, the world around us doesn't believe that. The world around us thinks you can do wrong, you can sin, even those with sin is, and it thinks you'll get off of it, you will not surely die, but we do die. So I think we're now at uh, the next hymn, oh, 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 how good is the Lord. It's number five. One more, and again.
that faster? <laughs> okay. So that's our text. The Lord God commanded Adam, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So uh, this is a meditation in two parts with another uh, song to listen to in the middle. So here is the man, Adam, in the midst of a perfect environment, he's in paradise, and he is a perfect creature. There is not any bentness in him. There is no bias towards evil in him, and he is given by his maker and friend only one prohibition. And even that one don't is in the context of an abundance of do's. God says to him, as it were, eat to your heart's content from all the luscious, wonderful trees and enjoy their satisfying fruits. But don't eat from the one tree. That tree is off limits for you. But all the rest you are free to taste and eat from. So what I want to stress today is the goodness of God. We thought also of his greatness and of his glory. But here is his sheer goodness to man. Man who is the crown of his creation. His handmade, hands-on, hand-crafted creature. Filled with his own breath. Filled with the Spirit. Pentecost was man and woman being filled with the breath of God, the Spirit of God, and remade in the divine image. But before that could happen, it needed the cleansing flame of the Spirit to purify their human hearts through the blood of Christ. This bent world is not Eden, and we bent creatures are not innocent or pure in ourselves. But God has recreated us in the pure image of himself. And we need the fire of the Spirit as well as the, the breathing of the Spirit, if you are saying. Anyway, God was so, so good to Adam and Eve. They were in very truth in paradise, in paradise. And he's still the same today. He is goodness personified. Our word for good, eh, for God, derives from the word for good. God and goodness, eh, in that sense, are, are, are interchangeable. He is a source, a fountain of all goodness, true goodness. And, and this is so important for all of us because we... We are tempted to doubt the goodness of God. And that's the problem. It started in the Garden of Eden, and it's been the problem of the human race ever since. Whittier, in one of his hymns, poems, says this, I see the wrong that round me lies. I feel the guilt within I hear with groan and travail cries the world confess its sin. Yet in the maddening maze of things and tossed by storm and flood to one fixed trust my spirit clings. I know that God is good. I know that God is good. Essentially, it is the goodness of God that Satan subtly attacks in Genesis 3. When he suggests to Eve, has God said, 
Are you really free to eat from all the trees in the garden except for this one? Isn't God keeping something desirable back from you? So he's saying, if God is so good, why this or why that? He says that to all of us. If God is good, why has this happened in my life? Why is this happening in the world? Why are there wars and all sorts of sufferings? And then he goes on to say, you can't trust someone who is not good. And God is really good. You need to trust yourself. Where does that get us? So, it always comes down to this. Can we trust the word of God in this holy book, the Bible? And when I became a Christian, I didn't trust the book at all. I had all sorts of doubts about Adam and Eve and creation and everything else. But when the Holy Spirit touched my heart, I knew that this book was the truth. And the more I study it, after a lifetime of study, and, and many folk here will say the same, you know that this is the truth. And you compare it to all the other religions and everything else, and you see that they are completely barren in comparison to what this book says, what the Word of God says. So, our trust is not just in the Word of God in the Bible, in Scripture, as we say, our trust is in the Word of God incarnated, made flesh in Jesus Christ. We're trusting a man, the second Adam, the last Adam. And further, our trust is in the Word of God who was crucified on the cross for us, for us poor sinners. We can trust a man who's willing to lay down his life for us. And so we trust the living Word of the living God, Jesus Christ. It's personal, is what I'm trying to say. It's not just trusting doctrines or ideas or teachings. We're trusting a person, and he is good. So good that he gave his life on the cross for us. And that word of God, Jesus Christ, that word of God is faithful and true, and he is coming back to this world in person. To sort everything out with mercy and with justice. And you can read about that in Revelation 19. So, we see how subtle the devil is when he tempts Eve, saying, Did God really say? He's beginning to draw her into a conversation which can only prove a dead end for her. Because it results in spiritual Day. It's the word of God that the devil is questioning. Now, we don't like folk to uh, question us and what we say. We don't like folk to cast doubt on our words when we speak truly. For it undermines our whole personhood. To be doubted undermines our personhood. So don't let us doubt the man, the logos, the word who died on the cross for us and rose again. Don't doubt him. Come what may, don't doubt him. We may not understand, but we can affirm the goodness of God. Like Whittier did. Yet in the maddening maze of things and tossed by storm and flood, to one fixed trust and one fixed ground, my spirit clings. I know that God is good. So back to Genesis 2 and 3. We lost Eden. We lost that garden paradise. But God has promised us another Eden, another garden city. In the book of Revelation it is called the New Jerusalem. And that paradise will more than make up for all our sufferings and sorrows and struggles that we endure because of the catastrophic fall of Adam and Eve. So just for a moment, let's think about the restoration of all things in the paradise of God 
that he is preparing for all who believe in Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Latin, I don't like Latin, can't be helped. I don't know Latin either. But we're going to listen to this. Keep going. So, this is a, a lovely hymn. It's about uh, someone who has died and he is being, she has been, he, she has been led into paradise uh, by the holy angels. And it's called In Paradise. Into Paradise. May the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs greet you at your arrival and lead you into the holy city of Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem. May the choir of angels greet you and like Lazarus, not Lazarus who raised from the dead, uh, but Lazarus who was uh, uh, having a real a bad time on earth, the parable of it, Lazarus and died. died and, um, and that Lazarus is, is the one quoted here. Uh, and he was in paradise and, and so on. Uh, and then the last line is, may you have eternal rest. So I don't know Latin, maybe it's something that you could. But uh, you should be able to follow the words in paradise. It's repeated quite often at different points. And if I knew Latin enough, I'd have put it all in the screen for you. Uh, and some of the words are repeated uh, again and again. So I'll try and point some of them out as we listen to maybe, uh, maybe, maybe I won't because I'm to make myself mix myself up. You know Latin? No. no. And you know Latin. God's well done, 
good and faithful servant, even with all our faults and failings. What can we not endure in this life for such an entrance into paradise? Just a few more words to say. We don't judge a book or a film or a work of art or a scientific work or someone's election promises. We don't judge these things until we have the final product. If you like, more simply, if you bake a cake, you don't taste the uncooked ingredients and pronounce judgment. It probably wouldn't be very nice, though I think some people uh, do uh, eat the uncooked ingredients sometimes. You wait until it's cooked, and then you taste it, and you make up your mind. And that's what I'm saying about the goodness of God, and all the agonising questions we often have down here. We need to wait for the final display of God's recreative handiwork, and then assess his work of redemption. Now, I put it like this, which is a bit of a cheek, but I put it like that to make my point. Of course, we don't judge God, he judges us, and he will honour his words. If our trust is in Jesus Christ, we are safe and secure, and ultimately we will be sinless for all eternity in paradise in paradise so we wait for the day of redemption and we are patient another hymn says this be still my soul thy god doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past thy hope thy confidence let nothing shake all now mysterious shall be plain at last. I joined the Covenant Fellowship prayer time on Saturday morning at nine o'clock, just before the General Assembly started. All the, the ministers and people in, in, in that fellowship, all of us were from around the country and we were crying out to God for a taste of the Pentecostal fullness of the Spirit in our church and nation. Part of the Spirit's Pentecostal work is that old men will dream dreams. Dreams of God astonishing his people with the uh, wonders of his grace. Uh, one minister there prayed, and I thought this was interesting, this is why I'm sharing it with you. One minister there prayed that those ministers who will retire in the next few years, he prayed that they would yet see God move in Pentecostal power, in astonishing power. And I thought it was very uh, nice of him to pray, he was a, a bit younger I think, uh, for those of us who could be retired or who may well retire at some point in the near future. And what I'm saying to you as we are an older congregation is we mustn't ever cease to dream our dreams and believe in God and expect God to work through us. It's, a, a, it, it's quite possible that his main work will come through older people in our land in these days. So, something to think about. Amen. And our final hymn is Lord, we come before you. One week, sir.